the between Where we are right now and where we're meant to be Where long it's been lost is made whole again With these tears and this pain no longer exists No more walking, we're running as fast as we can Consider this our second wave I'm almost home
son of God, son of man. I call you Savior with nail scarred hands. You will be my son in the morning light, bringing redemption to my dark night. Beautiful surrender is where I want to be. Locked into your arms for all eternity. Come and take my hand. You can lead me where you please. That beautiful surrender.
welcome to Worship with Green Hill Christian Church, wherever you are today. If you're worshiping at home, if you're out in the car, if you're working, we are so glad we get to spend a little bit of time with you. Let's put those hands together and let's sing today. To all who are the tired and the heavy laden, hope has come. To all who feel the weight of a broken spirit, Hope has come. Lift up your eyes, lift up your head. The power of our sin is there. To those who see, to those who see the love of a perfect father, hope has come. To those who see the light of a risen Savior, hope has come. Lift up your eyes, lift up your head. You know, we are one church meeting in many different locations around the city, around the county, really around the country. And we're so glad that you've allowed us to be a part of your day today. I got to see many of you yesterday at the canned food uh, food drive that we have, the drive through food drive. Uh, and I have something to celebrate with you, so get everyone around. If you're watching live, even if you're not watching live, get ready to celebrate with us. Uh, because we have surpassed our goal of one ton of food in one month. Not only that, but yesterday, in a matter of three hours... We collected a ton and a half of food. We collected 2,770 pounds of food in three hours. And that is something to celebrate. It's 
absolutely incredible what God can do through a church when we come together. And we're not going to stop. We're going to continue on together as we collect food again. So if you missed out yesterday, make sure you come on Saturday. If, you, if you're out, come and, and bring some canned foods to GCC on Saturday uh, from, from 9 to noon. And all of the food will go to the interchurch food pantry of Johnson County. Uh, maybe we can get five tons of food. Yeah, let's see what we can do when the church comes together. In just a few minutes, we are going to, to have a, a next step time uh, where uh, you will have an opportunity to make a next step with Jesus through a Zoom meeting. Information will be in the, the chat. The, the host will give you that information, the Zoom ID, as well as the password. If you need prayer today, if you need to talk to a minister or someone on staff, an elder, uh, we'd invite you to, to, to tune in to that, that Zoom room so that you can be a part of, of what's going on. If you can get prayer uh, from, uh, from somebody. And one last thing, in just a few minutes, we are going to partake in communion together. And so get ready for that. Uh, you, can, you can get some apple juice or some crackers or uh, whatever you have laying around the house. Uh, last week, my family used Dr. Pepper and tortillas. So you can use whatever you'd like. What's important is that we remember the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus together as we partake in communion together. So we've got a great time of worship planned for you. Uh, let's pray together as we continue. Father, we are so thankful for the opportunity that we have to gather together. And though we are separate, we recognize that we are one church. And so I pray that everything that we do uh, would glorify you. Uh, God, I pray uh, that, uh, that, that as we live our lives, uh, whether we're at home, uh, whether we're an essential worker, uh, whatever our situation is, um, God, that, that you would be glorified through us and that you would be, that we would shine your light. We love you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing, I give you glory.
into your homes today. You know, we have this really cool opportunity to invite Jesus, to make him welcome in our lives, and it's our prayer that we will all do that today, especially in light of what we're going to talk about. You know, with all of this recent time that we've had at home, I know that many of us have seized some of those spare moments to do some cleaning, uh, some sorting, some purging, and our family has been no exception to that. We've gone through a a number of different rooms and, and different storage compartments at home, We have several bags of clothes now, some old toys, uh, some unneeded school supplies that are all ready to donate. And as we've gone through closets and cabinets and drawers, there are certain things I've also noticed that we haven't found. I mean, in all of that sorting and purging, we have not found any parachutes or life preservers. Um, We have not found any defibrillators or tourniquets. We've not found any oxygen tanks or ventilators. No fire trucks, no ambulances to be found. We also haven't found any jaws of life or any stretchers. See, as we've done this household inventory, like many of you have, we have just discovered that we're a whole lot better at at cooking and laundry and cleaning and homework and mowing grass and playing games and watching movies than we are at heroic rescues. The, The things that we have on hand at home just demonstrate that we are not very well equipped to be in the life saving business. And I'll bet the same is true of many of you. Well, during this quarantine season, when our church has literally left the building, we are taking this opportunity to review some of the core beliefs that unite us as followers of Jesus. Over the last couple of Sundays, we've talked about what we believe about the Bible and about Jesus. And today our focus is on what we believe about the gospel. And I want you to know right off the bat that unlike us, God is in the life-saving business. On our website, under a a tab that just says about us, are seven what we believe statements. And those statements include this one. Every person has worth as a creation of God, yet all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are in need of a savior. I realize that's a little bit of a mouthful, but it's so important. So I want to ask you where you are to join me in saying that out loud. Every person has worth as a creation of God, yet all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are in need of a savior. See, the Old Testament book of Genesis explains that God made humanity, all of us, in his image. And that means that every person has value, not because of how attractive or athletic or talented or strong or intelligent we are, but simply because of God's image. That means that supermodels and rock stars And professional athletes and billionaires have no greater worth to God than people who are average looking or people who are disabled, people who are poor. Our worth is not about how important or about how valuable other people think we are. God loves us 
simply because he made us. Now, because we bear God's image, we have a, a moral consciousness. We have a, an awareness of eternity. We have a, a capacity given to us to choose. And our free will, that ability to choose, opens the door in all of our lives to another trait that we all share, and that trait is called sin. The Apostle Paul wrote in Romans chapter 3 that all, everyone, 100% of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, the Greek word that is translated sin is a word that literally means to miss the mark, like when an archer shoots an arrow that just zips wide of the target, or when a quarterback throws a football and, and it lands just a couple of steps behind the intended receiver. Our purpose in life is to honor God, and none of us do that perfectly. We all sin. We all miss the mark. We all fall short in many different ways, we do exactly what God says not to do, and we ignore what God instructs us to do. And Scripture says that's a big deal. Later in the book of Romans, Paul wrote that the wages of sin is death. The paycheck, the consequences of sin, isn't just that we die physically, although physical mortality is a part of sin's impact. Sin, Scripture says, causes us to die spiritually. God is holy and perfect, and unholiness cannot coexist with him. Our sin separates us from God's life-giving presence. And beyond this life, scripture calls that separation from God, hell. Hell is a real place prepared by God for Satan and his demons. It wasn't designed for people, but it's still the unfortunate destination of those who reject God. Separation from God, this is so important for us to understand. Separation from God doesn't just happen to people that we think of as really bad, like Hitler or Osama bin Laden. Hell will be experienced by those who ignore or reject God's efforts to rescue us from sin and death. That's the bad news. Now, let's check out what we believe statement number two, which says this. Forgiveness of sins... And the promise of eternal life are available to those who trust Jesus as their Savior and Lord. Again, I, I want us to wrap our heads around these statements. I want to ask you to say that with me. Forgiveness of sins and the promise of eternal life are available to those who trust Jesus as their Savior and Lord. Last Sunday... We celebrated Easter, we celebrated the resurrection of Jesus, and I called our attention to these words that Paul wrote to Christians in the Greek city of Corinth. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise... You have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. See, Paul shared that message about Jesus, and he referred to it as the gospel. The word gospel means good news. And at the core of that gospel message, Paul said, are these realities. Number one, Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And then second, Jesus was raised from the dead for our forgiveness. Both of those statements that we looked at just a moment ago in the book of Romans have a larger context. Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I, I shared that just a moment ago. But then verses 24 and 25 add this, and all are justified, that means declared righteous, all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. Romans 6.23, which we also looked at just a minute ago, not only says that the wages of sin is death, it goes on to add, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, wages are what we earn. But a gift is different than that. A gift is something we're given even when we don't deserve it. So the bad news 
is that we are all infected by sin, and as a result, we are all destined to die. But the good news of the gospel is that God loves us, and Jesus, God's son, paid sin's consequences for us. That was Jesus' point when he spoke these famous words in John chapter 3. He said, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. See, God is in the life-saving business. Our sins are already out there. We can't undo them. But Jesus has paid for them in full with his own sinless life and he's come back from the grave to prove that that payment was accepted. So everyone who trusts Everyone who obeys Jesus is given new, never-ending life. And I'm not just talking about a a get-out-of-hell-free card that we get to play later. I'm talking about real, abundant, purposeful life right now. We'll still experience physical death when these bodies give out, but then we will be with Jesus in heaven forever. Eternal life is God's gift. We can't earn it. Now, most people... I'm certainly included in this. Most people love getting gifts. I want you to take just a moment to think about some of the most generous gifts that you've ever been given. Just think about that for a moment. When I think about generous gifts, I have lots of examples, lots of different ways that I've experienced that, but there are two specifically that come to mind. About 18 years ago, Allison and I were invited by some generous friends to spend a weekend with them in Orlando. They offered to share their condo with us. They offered to buy our plane tickets and our Disney tickets. They paid all of our expenses. And then we accepted their gift by taking time off work, by arranging for Allison's mom to stay with our boys, and and buying a few meals during the trip. Then about 12 years ago, I was driving at the time a a 16-year-old Buick that we had bought from Allison's grandparents. And a generous friend said that he and his wife wanted to buy us a car. Now, we were initially hesitant because that just seemed like too much, but we we prayed about it, we talked it over, and we eventually decided to accept their offer, so they gave us a Ferrari. Actually, it it was a late model Honda Odyssey, but at that time, I mean, that was basically the Ferrari of minivans. These friends, they bought the car, and we accepted the gift by going to pick it up, by insuring it, by licensing and registering it. I mean, I'm still amazed when I think about the generosity of those gifts. When I think about the lavishness of those gifts, it still humbles me. They remind me of God's generosity. Because of my sins, I deserve judgment, not grace. We've all earned death. We've all earned separation from God in hell. But because he loves us, Jesus gave his life for our sins. And he rose from the dead. Eternal life is God's gift to us. It's not something that we could ever earn. But like any other gift, it's a gift that we we need to accept. And that brings us to what we believe statement number three. Those accepting Christ should repent of their sin, confess their faith in Christ, and be baptized into him. Again, I want you to say that out loud with me. Those accepting Christ should repent of their sin, confess their faith in Christ, and be baptized into him. The fifth book of the New Testament is called Acts. Now, Acts was written by Luke, who also wrote the Gospel of Luke, the third book in the New Testament. And the book of Acts picks up right where those Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John leave off. Throughout his ministry, and because we spent 90 days in those Gospels, not very long ago at all, you'll probably remember this, throughout his ministry, Jesus predicted repeatedly that he would go away and that when he did, he would send a helper. He would send his Holy Spirit to teach and equip his followers. You may recall that Jesus was crucified on a Friday right before the annual Jewish Passover feast. And that early on the third day, on on Sunday, Jesus rose from the dead. We celebrated that on Easter just last weekend. And over the next few weeks, Jesus appeared multiple times to a group of over 500 eyewitnesses. Now, 40 days after his resurrection, roughly 42 days after the Passover celebration, Jesus returned to heaven 
with a promise to his disciples to send his Holy Spirit and instructions to them to wait in Jerusalem for the Holy Spirit to arrive. And then 50 days after Passover, roughly eight days after Jesus left the earth, came another Jewish feast called Pentecost. And that feast brought Jews from all over the place to Jerusalem. During that festival, Jesus fulfilled his promise to send the Holy Spirit who miraculously enabled his disciples to communicate the gospel message in multiple languages that they had not studied before. That day, the apostle Peter convinced a Jewish crowd that Jesus, whose crucifixion they had demanded and witnessed just a few weeks earlier, was the Messiah that they had awaited for centuries. He had arrived, and when he came, they had not only failed to recognize him, but they had killed him. Acts chapter 2 says this, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, verse 38, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So after hearing Peter's message, this crowd of people understood that Jesus was the Messiah. They understood that they were guilty of killing him. They understood that he had then risen from the dead. They believed. They had faith. They knew. And they asked Peter, in light of that knowledge, in light of that belief, what should our next step be? What is it that we should do? And Peter told them, number one, he said, repent. Jesus' blood was on their hands and that would be true of all of us who have sinned they needed to change the way they looked at jesus the way they thought about him they needed to do a, a 180 degree turnaround from the way they'd been living they needed to give up the attitudes and the actions that had put jesus on the cross it's one thing for us to to regret or to feel sorry that we've sinned it's another thing entirely to change and that change is called repentance to repent is to turn away from our disobedience to God, our selfishness, our lust, our greed, our gossip, our dishonesty, our drunkenness. Whatever form our disobedience to God tends to take, repentance is an active process of turning away from that in order to turn back to Jesus. The second thing that Peter instructed this crowd of people to do in response to the gospel was to be baptized to declare their faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior by joining him in a watery, symbolic reenactment of his death and burial and resurrection. Scripture says that, that baptism entails a number of different things, but baptism is, for starters, a confession of sin. It is an acknowledgement that there is sin in our lives, that we are sinners and that we are in need of a Savior. 1 John chapter 1 says that if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we claim that there is not sin in our lives, we are directly disagreeing with what God declares about us. Verse 9 says, if we confess our sins, if we continually acknowledge our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. See, when we're baptized... We are confessing that we are sinners and that we need Jesus to save us. But baptism is more than that. Baptism is also a request for forgiveness. In Peter's Pentecost sermon, he urged people to be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21 says that baptism is not about taking a bath. It's not about physically washing dirt from our bodies. It's about asking God to give us a clean conscience. And then number three, baptism is a declaration of unity with Jesus. Peter said that baptism invites the gift of the Holy Spirit. Baptism invites the personal presence of God in our lives. Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 3 that all of you who were baptized into Christ Jesus have clothed yourselves with Christ. You have wrapped yourselves in Jesus. And for all of those reasons and more, baptism is important. If baptism is an instruction from Jesus that you have yet to, to bring your life into obedience to, I want to challenge you to do that. 
We recognize that during this season of social distance, that's a difficult thing to do, but we are looking forward to celebrating multiple baptisms as soon as we are able to reopen our doors and begin gathering together again. In Romans chapter 10, Paul quoted the Old Testament prophet Joel when he wrote, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Sin is a part of every person's life, so death is the norm in our world, and that's why Jesus came to die in our place, to rescue us from hell, to give us life. God's promise is that everyone who calls on the name of Jesus will be saved. We call on Jesus when we trust him to do what we can't do for ourselves, when we admit and we turn from our sin, when we obey him in baptism. The gospel reminds us that God is in the life-saving business. And with eternal life at stake, with an offer like that that God makes to us, our decision about Jesus Christ is the most important choice that any of us ever make. This is a more significant and farther reaching decision than choosing a college. This is a bigger deal than choosing a career. This is a more important choice than whom we decide to marry or what kind of car we drive or what home we live in. So more than anything else, what we want, what we pray, what we desire for you is that you would know and trust and follow Jesus. And we are here to help you do that. Like John mentioned a few minutes ago, starting right now, we have members of our staff available via Zoom to chat with you about your next step in embracing and obeying the gospel. That Zoom ID, that password that John shared earlier are on your screen right now. You'll find them in the comments. And we invite you to talk with us there after the service if there's anything at all that we can do to help you take a next step. Now, in just a moment, I'm going to lead us together in prayer. And then we want to encourage you, like John mentioned earlier, to take a few moments at home or wherever it is that you're worshiping right now to continue your personal time of worship by celebrating communion and by giving an offering to God just out of simple gratitude for his blessings. We're going to allow a few moments for you to do those things. We'll have some slides on the screen that will give you some explanation and some detail about how you can do those things. And then we're going to come back together and, and close our service together by singing a couple of more songs. I want to thank you again for allowing us to join you in worship today. We want to invite you to join us on Zoom after the service if we can be of help to you in taking the next step where the gospel is concerned. We love you and we miss you and we can't wait for the opportunity for us to be back together again as one body under one roof. But in the meantime, the Spirit of God remains alive and well. The Church of God is still very much at work and on the move. God is doing what God does. God is in the life-saving business and our ability or inability to gather in a, a place on a campus doesn't have any bearing on that at all. Thank you for allowing us to spend this time with you today. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we thank you today for the beautiful good news of the gospel. Jesus, thank you for coming, for giving your life in our place at the cross, for suffering for our sins in a way that you absolutely did not deserve. We are so grateful for that sacrifice and we stand in absolute awe of the power that brought you back from the dead. We praise you for your resurrection. We know that all authority belongs to you. And Father, we're so, so deeply indebted to you for inviting us on that basis to be a part of your family. To be adopted as your sons and daughters. God, we thank you for your mercy to us and we ask for your help in embracing that grace and living our lives in it. Father, modeling to everyone that knows us, everyone that we come into contact with, the truth that who we have been, what we have done, where we have been, doesn't define who we are because the gospel is bigger than that. We praise you for all that you've done to wash our past clean, to give us a hope and a future. Holy Spirit, we thank you for your willingness to live in us and to walk with us and guide us through life. Father, please help us on the basis of that message in the power of the gospel to live this day and every day in a way that honors you, in a way that shows your love and compassion to those around us. And God, we ask you to bring us all back together in a, in a unified way very soon. We ask all of this in the holy and mighty name of Jesus.
Beautiful surrender 